All right, our next speaker is a professor in the Department of Neurobiology at the University of Chicago. Her blog is The Brain is So Cool. Please everyone give a warm welcome to Peggy Mason. Hi everyone, I am Peggy Mason. I'm a professor of neurobiology at University of Chicago. I told Lauren that I'm so used to uh, introducing myself that I would introduce myself anyway. Um, so uh, Rebecca invited me to come and speak with you all and um, I never actually really knew why and then I, I just now asked her why and she's told me a few things but um, <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, so I am here and I have uh, been to a few of the talks which have moved me to um, amend my, my typical uh, talk, which as you'll see is all about rats. Uh, so we will get to the rats, but I just started, I wanted to, st I wanted to start with uh, musings on uh, skepticism. Uh, I also, I'll start and end with this. Uh, please do connect. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to, I love talking with uh, people in the public. Um, I give a massively open online course. It's a free course. It's 10 weeks long. It's through Coursera, uh, Understanding the Brain. It's a rockin' good time. Uh, I have a blog, thebrainiscocool.com, and um, I, I, I tweet. Who knew? But I do. Okay, so um, what is skepticism? Well, I, I, I'm not, I, I shouldn't be telling you. I'll tell you what skepticism is to me. <laughs> so to me, uh, skepticism is, is some, uh, exists on a continuum where you either have to make it over a mountain in order to change your mind, or you have to make it over a molehill. So there are things that, uh, that I am skeptical about and you would have to show me a ton, 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 ton of data and really be at me before I'd believe you that anything besides what I believe uh, is true. And then there are things where you could, you could knock me with a feather and I'd believe you. So I just want to go through some of the things that I find that I'm highly skeptical of. Uh, yeah, so my first thought was I'm not actually skeptical and then I realized I am very skeptical about several things. One of the things I'm skeptical about is isms of all sorts, including skepticism. <laughs> uh, I'm really skeptical about Purell. Uh, I don't for a second think that hand sanitizers do anything but dry your skin. Uh, I don't think that all of a sudden in the last 75 years when it became possible to do it, daily showers became a necess necessity. Uh, I don't think that newborns sh should live in a pristine, germ-free environment. I'm very skeptical about efforts to make spinal cord injured patients walk again. I'm very sympathetic with them I'm also skeptical about making them walk again. I'm skeptical about the utility of stem cells. We remind ourselves that we've had the mutation. We've known what the mutation is for sickle cell anemia for over half a century. And we've done exactly zero about it. Uh, I'm extremely skeptical about translational science. I think it's short-sighted, popular, but short-sighted. I'm skeptical about big data science. I'm skeptical about the efficacy of psychological and psychiatric evaluations. That's uh, Adam Lanza on the left and James Holmes, a former neuroscience student on the right, both uh, mass murderers. I'm skeptical about our, the accuracy of our perceptions. This is the happy Ed, John Edwards family. I'm skeptical about 
the accuracy of eyewitness accounts. That's kind of obvious. <laughs> no surprises there. Uh, I am actually skeptical that we'll, I, I study the brain, I study the nervous system, completely skeptical that we'll ever understand the brain. I'm uh, skeptical about extreme happiness, what you might call ecstasy, in, in, for anything longer than, than the time frame of an orgasm. I'm very skeptical about rebuilding New Orleans. Very, very confused on that topic, too. Um, I'm skeptical about vegetarianism. And as, my, as a cousin of mine, uh, I have a cousin named Paul Kafka who writes novels, and he said, he's, he said it in different words, but essentially I'm, I'm robbing him of his skepticism of wonderful. Uh, I'm skeptical of aromatherapy, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> I'm skeptical of uh, one of the great uh, canons of uh, neurobiology, of biology, physiology, which is Walter Cannon's book, The Wisdom of the Body. Uh, and I, I'm skeptical in the sense that I don't think that the body is particularly wise. I don't think the body is particularly sentient. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I, I think, you know, there's some, there's some nicely evolved systems that work well for us most of the time, and, and that's great, but uh, to, to go the extra step and call the body wise is, is I, I, I'm a skeptic there. And um, I'm, a, I'm a big skeptic as to knowing my own mind or you knowing your own mind. I think we're a lot of just so stories, post hoc explanations for things that we do. And uh, I, I will blog on that more extensively in the future. <laughs> uh, and I'm skeptical about whether I'm right. I mean, I could be right, I could be wrong. I'm very open to being wrong. Um, and then there are things that I'm completely not skeptical about. So. Uh, I'm not skeptical about either evolution or the, the sentience of non-human animals. And uh, my darling Minnie comes to mind. She's got a lot of stuff to say and do, places to go, people to see. Uh, she talks to me every day. And, uh, and there's somebody in there. Uh, I'm not skeptical about art or beauty. These are as real to me as, uh, as can be. I'm really, really not skeptical about neuroanatomy, either teaching it or learning it. And this is a picture that was taken in Paris when I had the opportunity to teach University of Chicago students at our center um, in Paris, the University of Chicago Paris Center. And uh, I was the first biology class that took place at the center. And um, so I, I tried to order sheep brains. That wasn't going to happen. So I went down to the butcher and said, can you get me some sheep brains? And lo and behold, he got me sheep brains. I tried to get formalin to, to fix my sheep brains in. And uh, that, that also wasn't going to happen. Don't particularly know why. But uh, we ended up going to the drugstore and getting ethanol, which is what has, was used, for instance, by Jean-Paul Broca in the late 1800s to preserve the first aphasic patient's brains. So I, I had my sheep brains. I had them in alcohol. They were ready to be uh, dissected and examined by the students. And we needed a room. And the room I got has a line of Chagall prints on the back, which you can see. <laughs> so that, I'm really, really not skeptical about doing neuroanatomy with a bunch of interested students in a room with Chagall prints. <clears throat> um, this is my darling nephew, bungee jumping. And uh, I'm not skeptical about embodied emotion, which is what's happening with him. So. As Sam jumps off some cliff in New Zealand, he's a happy guy. This is not a time for reflection. It's not a time for sadness. This is embodied emotion. 
your body will lead, your mind will uh, obey. Um, and I'm not skeptical about affect. I think uh, I am fairly skeptical about logic. Logic has its place, but in my opinion, it's, uh, it's overblown. Uh, affect is a thing that has driven evolution through uh, time in memoriam, and, uh, and it, is, it is something that, in my opinion, has power beyond, beyond what we t tend to, uh, to give it. And I'm not skeptical about craving. I'm more skeptical about happiness than wanting. So we want stuff. We crave stuff. And when we get it, do we like it? Have you ever watched, have you ever watched somebody win a championship? So they win the NBA championship or they win the World Series or, you win, or they win the, uh, uh, the Super Bowl. The, that moment of happiness, you can watch it. It lasts for seconds to minutes. It is the wanting, the people who didn't, who lost, you can see on their faces, and that, that, that need to get back there and to get it, that will endure for year, for the year, for the years, but the actual joy, the supreme moment of joy does not last long. And that's, um, that actually goes back to evolution. Craving is something that is evolutionarily useful. Happiness is not. Why be happy? You're just stuck there. It's not going to make you do anything. Evolution wants you to make, go do things. Go eat, go drink, go have sex, and uh, make sure your kids survive. So crave, good, happy, no. <laughs> uh, I'm not skeptical about the veracity of Facial expressions, this is just a, a few facial expressions from uh, uh, a colleague's daughter. Um, and here's one from uh, Rodin's Burgers of Calais. And this is, uh, this is a story where the Burgers of Calais are sacrificing their own lives for the good of the town. Uh, and you can read on his facial expression a uh, dignity, a, an acceptance, um, and, and a strength. Um, and this individual's doing uh, what he feels is the right thing to do. Um, and I, as I'm going to spend most of my time uh, telling you, uh, I'm not particularly skeptical about a innate drive for mammals to do good things. The counter, the, the, the opposing possibility is that we're all driven by selfish motives. And that's a very popular idea. Um, and what I would like to argue today is, yeah, maybe, maybe that has some truth, but we have also a very strong mammalian inheritance to want to do good, to want to help others. Um, and we're all selectively skeptical. Actually, I'm going to, uh, I put all the words in here. I usually give talks with no words. Um, I put the words in for people who might be hard of hearing or, um, or deaf. And are, are there such individuals in the, in the audience? OK, so I'll, I'll speak this instead of um, showing it. So there is a, um, a study. There have been several studies, but there's a group at Michigan that uh, would, would give people an article uh, to read, and in this instance, they gave an article to read um, talking about uh, George W. Bush's assertion that cutting taxes would, in the end, raise revenues. And then there was a statement, and actually I will show it um, because I can't remember it, <laughs> that the Bush tax cuts were followed by an unprecedented three-year decline in 
in nominal tax revenues from two trillion to 1.8 trillion in three years. So the conservatives who read this were just, were, were two times as likely to believe Bush's uh, claim was true as were conservatives who did not read the correction. In other words, the incoming belief is completely impervious and possibly inversely uh, uh, facilitated by factual information. And you know, so one conclusion is that only conservatives are, are, are selectively skeptical, that only conservatives reject facts in, in, um, that oppose their incoming beliefs. I, I think that's extraordinarily unlikely, and, and I can tell you that there have been some annoying um, findings that I didn't want to believe that I have come to believe are true. So I don't think it's just conservatives that are uh, <laughs> that are selectively skeptical, and uh, and we come back to aromatherapy. So in the New York Times just earlier this year. Uh, and this, this is something that I could have, I should have pieced together part of this uh, from things I, I know, but um, I never did piece it together until I read this article, which is that we have, we have what are called chemoreceptors all over the body. So chemoreceptors, the biggest concentration of them are, is in our nasal epithelium, our nose, and that's what enables us to uh, detect the chemicals, the, the chemicals that are in the air. Well, it turns out that a bunch of those same receptors that are in our nose are elsewhere, and including in our skin. So um, there are more than 15 of these olfactory receptors or chemoreceptors that are in the skin, and that uh, their presence actually facilitates or, or um, their action elicited by a sandalwood-like smell facilitates wound healing. Okay? So not particularly something I wish was true, but there you go. So anyway, the bottom line is that skepticism works for everybody. It's, I, I, would, I would argue that it um, is present in everybody, and the, the important thing is uh, to be willing to change your mind <laughs> with, with enough evidence. Okay, um, I want to say one last thing. Uh, while I, I, I am both, I am very opinionated, let me put it that way. And, I, and actually, I had an argument with some colleagues the other day, and, and somebody said, well, you know, you, you've switched your, your, you're saying two things. I said, well, yeah, I, I get to have more than one opinion. Um, and, and I definitely do feel like having opinions is, uh, is, a, is a freebie, and it's a, it's a real um, cornerstone of intellectual engagement and intellectual thought. So I think having opinions is great. I, I myself, do not particularly need everyone to agree with me, and I would urge you to... Um, to accept others' uh, viewpoints. Um, and one place where this worked spectacularly well was in this uh, massively open online course that I gave, Understanding the Brain. So we had more than 55,000 people sign up. We had about around 20 to 30,000 that followed the course through the weeks. And there were about four or 5,000 people that would regularly go on to the discussion forums and talk about various topics having to do with the brain. And what was remarkable was the diversity, not in terms that I'm used to. So at University of Chicago and other um, in university uh, or institutions of higher education, we typically talk about diversity in demographic terms, gender, race, religion, country of origin. This was actually diversity of 
opinion, diversity of worldview, diversity of perspective. So there were people that were vehement atheists, there were people that were um, born again Christians, there were Muslims, there were uh, all manner of backgrounds, people that were physicians, people that practiced um, one or another of uh, some alternative uh, healing profession. Uh, so, and, and what was really remarkable and which I loved because I am a neuroevangelist is uh, that they left it all at the door and they, and they concentrated on the brain. So the discussions were about the brain, the discussions were about the nervous system, and there were very, very few personal attacks. And when, when, those, when those happened, we could um, step in. Okay, so that's, uh, that's my 20 minute digression into skepticism. Uh, and now I'm gonna tell you uh, a tale of mammal the mammalian innate drive to help another in distress. And the background for this is why do we help? We know that humans are extraordinarily uh, willing to help under many circumstances, and this simply shows a picture of um, about a dozen individuals who worked in nonstop for over 24 hours to get this young boy who dropped into a sinkhole in the Indiana dunes, and they worked until he was out. They got him out, he was blue, they took him to University of Chicago hospitals, uh, and, and he recovered, and today he's absolutely fine. He doesn't remember the, the whole incident, but he's absolutely fine. But those people worked to their great, uh, with great cost to themselves. There was no saying whether their sinkhole was gonna open again, whether they themselves were safe. They were certainly working under um, duress with minimal uh, uh, time for rest and, and food and, and so on. So is the reason they helped because they've been taught to be good to their neighbors? Is that why they helped? Because they learned the golden rule, either in, in a secular version or a religious version. Put it another way, does helping require co fancy cognition? Fancy cognition being the cognition that results from activity in what we call the neocortex. Neocortex is six-layered cortex. It's the cortex that exists only in mammals. No other phyla has uh, neocortex. So another possibility is that we're all the brain is essentially a little, or the human brain is essentially a, a, a little baby economist is in there saying, okay, what are the costs to me if I help and what are the benefits to me if I help? And they weigh, the brain weighs those costs and benefits and comes out with, uh, with the answer. And, uh, and I will argue that it, it is n none of those. Um, and I just wanna give credit to my um, colleague in Bal Benami Bartal, who started out as a graduate student, was a postdoc with me for a while, and is now um, on her road to independence at, at University of California in Berkeley. And it was in Bal's idea to start looking at this. She wanted to know whether uh, helping had a biological basis. And in order to answer that question, so the, the way the way that a biologist answers that question is to say, well, if rats help, then culture cannot be important, religion can't be important, and in fact, fancy cognition can't be important. They have a neocortex, but it's not very well developed. Um, and so, uh, so the way we went about this was to say, let's give the rats an opportunity to help and see if they do. And so what I'm gonna tell you about is Will, rat, will rats help another individual in distress? I'll tell you a little bit about why they help. The answer is yes to the first question, by the way. 
<laughs> That's just why we get to go on. <laughs> um, so we'll, I'll tell you a little bit about why they help, what motivates them to help, and finally, who do they help? Okay, so when we decided to go about this, uh, what we wanted to do was to give them an opportunity to, to, to help, something that was doable by a rat. And you have to put yourself in rat shoes, so to speak. And, um, and that is, that's a little difficult to do. Um, what we ended up doing was we made this arena that's about yay big. And in the center of the arena, we put this uh, plexi plexiglass tube, which is called a restrainer. You can see here and in the following pictures, the restrainer is not actually restraining the rat, it's just preventing him from getting out of the tube. The rat is actually not tightly constrained. The rat can move around, can turn around in the restrainer. Um, and then what we did was we, we made a door on only one end of the restrainer, but that door could only be opened from, the, from a rat on the outside. So the rat on the inside is trapped. That rat's trapped, can't get out. There's a rat on the outside, we call him the free rat, and he, he can or cannot, he can choose whether to open the door or not. <clears throat> it took us a long, long time to make the door, and that's how hard it is to put yourself in, in rat land. Uh, so we actually had to put in two counterweights because the door is really heavy for a rat. Okay, so it took, it, they'd, they'd kind of nudge at it, but it would fall back and they'd give up. Um, and what we did was we put the, the free rat and the trap rat in there together. And these initial experiments that I'll tell you about are two rats that live together. They're cage mates, they're pals. Um, and <clears throat> put them in there for an hour a day for uh, 12 days. Now there's nothing, there's no reward. If the rat lets the guy out, we have provide, or we provide no reward. If the rat lets the, um, if the free rat lets the tra trapped rat out, he doesn't get food, he doesn't get anything from us. So there's really no reason to do this, except maybe he wants to do it. So what happens? Well, we immediately knew that something was going on because rats don't actually like to be in open spaces. They, they express something called thigmotaxis. Taxis means you, you, like to, um, like you like to reach the sun, you like to reach water, you like to reach uh, whatever. Well, thigmotaxis is you like to be right next to a, a wall. So rats really like to be next to a wall, it's safer. When they're out in the open, and this is evolutionarily um, uh, evolutionary inheritance, the, the rats in our lab have actually not been out in the open for generations, they're lab rats. But nonetheless, they do not like to be out in the open because that's where predators can get them. So they stick to the walls, but what we saw when we put the free rat and the trapped rat into this situation was that immediately the, the free rat went to the restrainer. He, went, he left the safety of the walls to go to the restrainer and showed a ton of what we call restrainer-focused activity. They would dig at the restrainer, they'd climb on the restrainer, they'd there is a lot of snout to snout contact between the trapped rat and the free rat. There's a lot of interest, like what's going on here? And um, I'll just show you a movie of what that looks like. I think this will work. Or not. Okay, so anyway, what the, what the movie shows is that um, if, the, if there's a trapped rat in the restrainer, the free rat does spend a lot of time near the restrainer. But if the restrainer is either empty or has an Ikea toy rat within it, the free rat does not spend time next to the restrainer. So the idea being that 
there's something about having, it's not about the restrainer, it's about the rat within the restrainer that's driving the free rat's behavior. And what we did was we, we basically quantified what, what was their behavior across the 12 days of testing. And what you see here on the left, so on the, the x-axis is the testing day every day. And the y-axis is the percent of rats that open the door every day. And in blue are the rats that were tested with a trapped rat. And in black are the rats that were tested with either an empty restrainer or an IKEA toy rat. And um, only when tested with a trapped rat did more and more of the rats open the restrainer on progressive days. Not only did they op more of them open, but they also opened it at a shorter and shorter latency. It took them less and less time every day to do this. Um, so, and that's shown on the right. And so by the, the final day, they would come in, they'd kind of look around, uh, see that it was the same gig as yesterday, and then they'd uh, open the, the restrainer within a couple minutes. So what does this tell us? It tells us that they're not opening the restrainer because the restrainer is there. They're opening the restrainer only if it contains a trapped rat. So the first possible explanation for this behavior is, is what I call the Mount Everest explanation. They open the restrainer because it's there. That's not the case. Um, so the next uh, piece of data that I want to show you is, is what this looks like in a, on a daily basis. And so this just shows you eight rats. Uh, we run eight at a time. So this is one cohort of rats. This is a pretty typical um, experiment uh, outcome. And what you see in the solid black squares is a rat who opens the door on today and then on the next day. And remember that I was talking about craving. Craving is what drives evolution. Well, how do you know if somebody, if an individual craves something? You know if they crave something if they do it again, okay? You do things again if you crave to do them. And so these rats, all those black squares are instances where they opened the door on one day and then they did it again on the next day. Okay, so they're going into that scary center of the arena once again and opening the door. And what you can see is that for uh, five of these rats, once they start opening, the first time they open, they like it. They like something about it, they crave it, they do it again. And they don't essentially, they, in this cohort, they didn't skip days. On the final day, they open again. We don't know that they opened on the last day, which is why it's a, a plus sign instead of a solid sign. Now, there were a minority of rats that don't open, that never became what we call openers. And for them, it clearly was not a reinforcing activity. So what you can see in these bottom three rows, or the two of the three bottom rows, is a rat that opened the door and then didn't do it again the next day. And may, maybe did it occasionally a few days later. But for that rat, it wasn't, it wasn't rewarding. Um, but for, and, and so about 25% of the rats don't become openers. And, and we have ideas about why that is. Um, we have evidence for why that is, but um, that's... Uh, a matter for a different, a different day. But for the bulk of them, 75% of them, the ones that become openers, why do they do it? Well, one thing that's clear is that opening the door is very salient for them. Once they open the door, this shows their velocity, how fast they move. And remember, not moving is an option here. The rat can go into the corner and just sit there. So movement is motivated. They're moving because they want to. And, and this dashed line, the vertical dashed line, is the moment when they open the door. And what you see is that their, their activity level goes way up, and it stays up for about 10 minutes after they open the door. 
That tells us that it's a big deal, it's an event. Um, and I don't know whether this is gonna play. Are you gonna play? That's so sad. Um, so you would see, anyway, you can see, you can see the rats on YouTube. <laughs> there are quite a few uh, videos of them out there. Um, and it's really interesting to, to see them sell, to see the free rat celebrate. What's one of the interesting pieces of it is the free rat opens for the trap rat, the trap rat gets out, the free rat is very excited by this and follows the trap rat around the restraint, around the arena. The, the, the trap rat does not particularly seem that excited by the whole thing and particular and really not grateful. We've absolutely seen, we've seen absolutely no evidence of gratefulness. Um, but the, the trap rat, I mean, I'm sorry, the free rat is very, very pleased, and appears very pleased with himself and, and actually follows the, the trap rat, jumps on the trap rat, licks the trap rat, and continues this for about 10 minutes. Okay, so, so when we think about uh, the motivation, well, maybe the motivation is simply that they want to play with the rat. You know, rats are very social. So that's a reasonable explanation that, that the free rat actually just wants the trap rat to get, get on out here so we can go run around and play together. Um, that's a possibility. So when we, we, we decided that we were going to address that possibility with a modification of, of the experiment, where we, what we did was we put two arenas together. And instead of placing the restrainer in the middle of one arena, we put it at the div at between so that the door was at the divide between the two arenas. So when the free rat opened the door, the trap rat would get out, but not to the same arena that the, that the free rat was in. So we get out into the next arena. And this prevents any immediate social contact between the free rat and the newly liberated trapped rat. And um, so what we did was we, we did this with just a few rats in, in counterbalanced order. Half of them started with a trapped rat in the arena and then went to an empty restrainer, and half of them started with an empty restrainer and then went to a trapped rat. And uh, if you look at the right, that's a little bit easier to understand. It's a little bit easier to see. What you see is the cohort that started with a trapped rat. So initially, they open, they're, they're trained actually in the normal uh, one arena paradigm. They open the door, they continue to open the door if they go to this two arena setup with a uh, trapped rat in there. And then when we switch them at this second point, actually I can use, can you see my cursor? Yes, good. Okay, so at this point we switch them over to an empty restrainer and when we switch them to an empty restrainer, it takes them a little while, but eventually they stop opening. So they're extinguishing the, this, this learned behavior, but eventually they do. And it's the reverse case um, if we reverse the order. And so what that tells us is that there's, it does not, uh, this behavior does not require immediate social contact. Now, we, at that point, we speculated that, it, that the motivation was a rat version of empathy. That the free rat felt, felt the distress of the trapped rat, contaged or caught the distress of the trapped rat, and acted to uh, mitigate that distress. And we now have evidence that, that uh, that's the case. I, I'm just gonna show you one piece of that evidence, and that is that if we give 
a chill pill, essentially. We give midazolam, which is a, um, a drug that's very uh, in the same family as Valium. So we're basically chilling out the trapped rat. Um, now, what will the free rat do? And it turns out that what happens if you look, uh, so they either got saline or they got, uh, or they got this um, chill pill. And if they get the chill pill, they don't, they don't open the door. The free rat doesn't open the door for a rat that's sitting in the restrainer looking like everything's peachy keen. So what this tells us is that the, the free rat is actually responding to the affect of the trapped rat. It's also further evidence that they're not opening the door just to play with the, with the, uh, with, with the rat, the trapped rat, because they could play with the, the rat who has a, who's gotten a chill pill, but they, they don't do that. They don't open the door. They don't, I mean, essentially, how the hell would they know that there's any need to open the door? They cannot, my, my uh, we haven't actually proven this, but my hunch is that rats can't use cognition alone. So that, so that if there's a, a, an undistressed rat in the trap, in, in the uh, restrainer, they won't open for that undistressed rat because they have no clue that the rat wants to get out because the rat doesn't want to get out. Um, so they can't say to themselves something that you might be able to say to yourself. Oh, if I were in that restrainer, I wouldn't want to be in that restrainer. I would really want somebody to let me out. So I'm going to let this person out. And so that that's not available to them. But what they are working on is they're working on whatever emotion they get from the other individual. And that ability to um, effectively communicate between individuals is something that has a robust uh, evolu evolutionary um, adv ad advantage. So it comes, it, uh, everyone, I think it's common, uh, commonly agreed that the, or, that the key um, origin of affective communication in mammals is the fact that offspring need mom, and mom needs to know how offspring feel. If mom doesn't know when the offspring are hungry, cold, or in danger, mom loses offspring, and mom has an evolutionary dead end. Not going to work. So mom knows how offsprings feel. And the amazing thing that our results show is that that ability to affectively communicate has been generalized. It's generalized beyond the mom-pup uh, relationship. So, uh, so what this tells you is that helping another in distress is a biological mandate. And it also suggests that not helping another is something that you actively suppress. You're suppressing the, uh, an innate drive to help. And certainly, personally, I feel like that's what goes on every time I walk down the street and I decide not to give money to a person uh, who's homeless on the street asking for money. It's almost as though I have to gird myself to not give them money, to not care. Um, okay, so I don't have too much time left, but I really want to show you the, uh, the who, who do we help. And so the, the bottom, the, the question that I, we're trying to answer here, or that we did answer here is, does it matter who the individual is? Will one individual help another individual no matter who? And we had done our, all of our original work on cage mates, and so people had been asking us about strangers. And there's this bizarrely common idea that people don't help strangers or mammals don't he help strangers. Um, uh, certainly people help strangers all the time. You, you give money to tsunami victims that you've never met. Um, okay, so in the, in the rat 
with rats, we can ask the question of, uh, will rats help a stranger? And what we did was we simply set this up where we do the regular paradigm, but instead of being paired with the same cage mate for 12 days, now the rat is paired with a different stranger each day. Okay, so there's a stable of 12 strangers. Every day they see a new stranger. Uh, lo and behold, they, they open for them. There's no difference. I actually gave this experiment to an undergraduate. He came back up about two or three weeks later. He said, you know, Peggy, there's nothing there. They're, they're exactly the same as cage mates. So we scratched our head for a while, and then we realized that um, these lab rats have actually been inbred since the, depending on the, on the strain, since the 1910s or 1920s. And while they're, they are genetically heterogeneous, they're not inbred strains, they are heterogeneous, eh, they got a lot of similarities. It's kind of like your fifth cousin twice removed. So we thought, well, what if we try a different strain, one that doesn't have that, didn't go through that same genetic bo uh, bottleneck back in the 20s. So we chose, the, the rats that we'd been using were all uh, white albino spray dolly rats, and we chose this very lovely uh, strain called Long Evans, which is a non-albino rat that has a black cape. Has a white background coat with a black cape. And we did two conditions, one where they were cage mates and one where they were tested with 12 strangers. And what we found was they open, I'm going through this quickly because the punchline is, is worth it. Um, they open for the cage mate, but they don't open for the stranger. Along the way, serendipity happened. It's an interesting story, which I don't have time to tell you, but for anyone that's interested, I'm happy to. Um, and we decided to do an, a final experiment where we would look at whether they had to be individual, did it have to be a cage mate? Or could they just be familiar with the type of rat? So what we did was we housed the albino rats with a black cape rat for two weeks. And then we rehoused them, albino rat with another albino rat. And then we tested them with black cape strangers. So they have known exactly one individual from the black cape stranger strain. And the question is, will they act as though they know or don't know the black cape strangers? And the answer is they are terrific openers. This is the red line and what you can see is uh, they come down here and they open at short latency um, a lot more, uh, as many open for that as for, the, for a cage mate. So what that tells you is that the familiarity with the strain is critical, the familiarity with the individual is not. It also tells you that this is a very environmentally uh, determined uh, behavior. They, uh, we, we can sculpt who they're gonna help by the experiences that they have, by living with another individual. So the question becomes, is there any role for genetics? So if familiarity counts for so much, is there any role for genetics? And this is where we got to do one of the world's most fun, it was probably one of the most fun experiments I've ever done in a many decades career. Um, uh, and it's also an experiment that could not be done in humans. So in this experiment, what we did was on the day of birth, we took the albino rats and we put them into a litter of black caped rats. They grew up, they never saw another rat of their type. They grew up in a world that was completely populated by this other strain. They never saw another individual like themselves. Now, we raised them up, and, they, and, and, I, and I can tell you, just in case you're worried, rat moms are amazing. They are terrific. They will take care of the, of the new pup. They do not care that it looks different. And the pups don't appear to care either. So they raised up. They were very healthy. 
And then we test them when they're adults with either strangers of their own strain or strangers of the foster strain. Well, they've lived their whole lives with the foster strain, so it was no surprise. It was a control, but it was no surprise that they opened perfectly well for the um, foster strain. But what was unbelievable is that they do not open for other individuals of their own strain. So genetics counts for exactly zero in this regard. Exactly zero. So this is, uh, that's the data, those are the data. They do not open for rats of their own strain. They do not know who they are except by looking around them. They know who they are with regard to who they're going to offer help to by who surrounds them, not by looking in a mirror. No mirrors in nature. Um, so uh, I just, I'll, I'll end with, with a, a cautionary tale that what I've told you is true for a very particular paradigm in the helping distress space. So it is, it, it, whether or not to help depends on many factors. And we haven't varied either the need or the cost of the helping. We varied the familiarity a little bit. But just so that you get an, a sense of how this works, will you, will you give $20 to a perfect stranger so they can go to the movies? Probably not. Will you give your kid $20 to go to the movies? Well, possibly. Will you, uh, will you help an individual who's just been crushed by something that fell because of an earthquake? and you don't know that person, perfect stranger, well, probably you will help them. So it really is this very multidimensional space where, um, where the need of the individual in distress, the cost to, of helping, the familiarity, the privacy, whether they're a bystander, et cetera, all of these things factor in. But the bottom line is that, that we do part of the equation is a mammalian inheritance to do good and to, uh, and to help individuals in distress and help them out of distress. And that's a powerful notion. So when faced with distress, my message to you is act like a mammalitarian, okay? Um, these are the people that, that did the work in my laboratory um, and I would love to stay connected with all of you. Thanks a lot.